I'm going to read to you from Jonah chapter 4 and verse 1. Jonah 4 verse 1. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Have you any right to be angry? Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the vine so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said. I'm angry enough to die. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? Let me just remind you of the story so far, if you haven't been with us in recent weeks and are not familiar with the story of Jonah. Jonah was a prophet in Israel and God called him one day to go and preach to the city of Nineveh, which was a great surprise to Jonah because Nineveh was not part of Israel. In fact, it was the capital city of Assyria, the oppressive superpower to the north of Israel. Jonah instead went in the opposite direction, headed for Tarshish. And while he was on a boat crossing the Mediterranean, they ran into a storm. Jonah got thrown overboard. He was swallowed by a whale or by a great fish, should I say. Whale is not in the text itself. Followed by, swallowed by a great fish. And in the belly of the fish, he began to talk to God and realized that he was running away. And eventually, he was vomited up. And God recommissioned him a second time and sent him to Nineveh. This time he went, preached the message God gave him, which was simply this. Forty days and Nineveh will be destroyed. When the people heard the message... They were convicted and responded in such a way that God, when he saw their response, said, or at least it says in chapter 3, verse 10, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion on them and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. And as a result, there was rejoicing in heaven. There was no doubt rejoicing in Nineveh. It was probably rejoicing in Israel, and there's rejoicing in Jonah. Well, not quite. There was rejoicing in heaven, we know that. There was probably rejoicing in Nineveh because they had believed that God was going to bring destruction. Now he had relented of that. There may have been rejoicing in Israel when the word got back. I don't know. But as for rejoicing in Jonah, no, definitely not. Chapter 4, verse 1 says, But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. Now let me ask the question, what in the world is going on? This has probably been the most successful preaching in Jonah's entire ministry. A whole city has repented before God. This is one of the most needy places on earth. And yet Jonah is upset. And let me explain his, his reason for his being upset. Let him explain it in verse 2. It says, he prayed to the Lord. So what he says, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? 
That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. These wonderful virtues that Jonah talks about in God, the fact that he is gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love, relents from sending calamity. These virtues in God are suddenly to Jonah not virtues but vices, not strengths but weaknesses in God. Now why does Jonah feel this way? Let me give you two reasons, first of all. I'll give you what I'm going to call a theological reason. First, by theological reason, what I mean is that God's actions contradict Jonah's understanding of God's purpose and his intent and his working. Jonah believed that Israel was God's chosen people, which they were. God had set them apart as a nation, but he misinterpreted that as being that Israel was set apart for privilege rather than for purpose. That is, that Israel were elitist in their relationship with God, that they had privileges that nobody else should have. He did not recognize that the reason why God had set Israel apart was, as God said to Abraham at the beginning, that they might be a blessing to the world. They instead have seen it as being a blessing to themselves, period. They divided the world into us and them, Jew and Gentile, the blessed and the unblessed. And God's call to them as God's call to us is never simply to privilege, though there is privilege, but to purpose, to service to being a means of blessing the world. And Jonah was very typical in that he forgot that. And so he reasoned it is not fair for God to bring blessing onto Nineveh. These are not God's chosen people. Let me say, by the way, that whenever our theology or our doctrines or our beliefs conflict with the character of God, you've got hold of some bad theology. Because... It's God's character that lies behind his truth. And when Jonah spells out that you are gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love, he is speaking of issues of God's character, which he now sees as being weaknesses in God's dealings with Nineveh. So there are theological reasons. Second, there are patriotic reasons. Jonah loved his own people and the Assyrians, in which Nineveh was the capital city, were the primary threat to the security and the peace and the stability of Israel. They were the superpower breathing down their necks from the north, who eventually would take a lot of them off into exile. The whole northern kingdom, which is where Jonah was from, were taken off into exile by the Assyrians. Jonah elsewhere had preached the expansion and the prosperity of Israel and his prophecies came to pass during the reign of Jeroboam II, one of the great kings of Judah. And uh, let me read you from 2 Kings chapter 14 and verse 25 where it says that Jeroboam restored the boundaries of Israel in accordance with the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, spoken through his servant Jonah, son of Amittai. Jonah had accurately predicted the expansion of Israel. And this is in the face of Assyria's status as the superpower and the tyranny that came from Assyria at the time. And the reason why he had fled to Tarshish in the first place is because he held a deep prejudice against Nineveh because he held a deep prejudice towards his own people, Israel. And now when he's eventually gone, when God recommissioned him the second time and preached in 40 days, God will destroy them and God is now going to withhold that destruction. Jonah feels humiliated and discredited. Not only that, God's actions are inconsistent with Jonah's theology and Jonah's patriotism. And so the result is 
that he is angry. God has changed his mind. He's given him a message, 40 days and God will destroy you. But because of their repentance and their mourning, their sin, God relents and says he will not destroy them. And Jonah's anger in the beginning of the chapter then becomes the basis of a dialogue throughout chapter 4 between Jonah and God. Not only is Jonah angry, but he's depressed and in fact he is suicidal because he says in verse 3, Now, O Lord, take away my life. It's better for me to die than to live. Well, obviously, there's some very serious issues here, and I want to examine them with you. In this dialogue, it's God who asks all the questions, and it's Jonah who makes all the assertions. Now, we might have expected it to be the other way around. But God asks the question, Jonah makes the assertions, and God basically asks him three questions. In chapter 4 and verse 4, he says, Have you any right to be angry? He's speaking there about the people. Are you, have, any, have you any right to be angry about the people of Nineveh? In verse 9, he says, Do you have a right to be angry about the vine? Now, the vine and the people of Nineveh are parallels. We'll see that in a few moments. And in verse 11, the third question is, Should I not be concerned about that great city? And we're going to come to that question finally. Now, the big issue with Jonah is, of course, his anger. Four times Jonah is referred to as being angry in this chapter. In verse 1, Jonah was displeased and became angry. Verse 4, the Lord said, have any right to be angry? Verse 9, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? End of verse 9, I am angry enough to die, said Jonah. So obviously anger is an issue for Jonah. And it's very interesting, in the light of the fact, he says to God in verse 2, amongst other things, I know that you're a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger. Jonah, however, is quick to anger. And in his questions to Jonah, he treats his anger with respect, but he sees his anger as the symptom of the issue that Jonah has to face and to deal with. You see, our emotions are symptoms of what is going on under the surface of our lives. And I want to go under the surface with you a little bit with Jonah for a few minutes. Our emotions, and especially our negative emotions, are, are like the lights on the dashboard of the car. When a red light comes on, if you're driving down the highway and the red light comes on, you know something's wrong. It's sending you a message. Something in the engine isn't as it should be. I don't like it when the red light comes on in my car. And of course, you can do one of two things to get rid of the red light. You can either go under the hood and find out what's wrong, or you can smash the light. <laughs> That'll get rid of the red light. And negative emotions, when they surface, are like a red light on the dashboard. And sadly, the way we deal with that is we smash the light and hope that that's fixed the problem. But it doesn't. As we're going to see, it goes underground. It becomes a controlling influence in our lives. Because our emotions reveal what's really going on. And our emotions are related to our aims and goals in life. Our positive emotions are ones we experience as we fulfill our aims and goals in life. Our negative emotions are those we experience when our goals and aims are thwarted in life. For an example, anger is symptomatic of unobtained goals. That you want something and don't get it. Things don't go your way. And so the result is Anger. You see this in children whose, anger, who, whose uh, emotions are very close to the surface. If a child does not get what it wants, it usually responds in anger. That's why it might throw a tantrum, uh, but the tantrum is a symptom of something. It wants something and can't get it. Anger is a symptom of unobtained goals. Another negative emotion, guilt, 
or shame is a symptom of unreached goals. You want to be something or do something and you fail to reach that objective and so the result is shame or guilt. That's where that emotion comes from. The negative emotion of anxiety or fear is symptomatic of uncertain goals. If you're not sure what you're supposed to do, the result is anxiety. Or what is supposed to happen? You become anxious. So if you can't get what you want, we get angry. If we can't reach what we want, we become guilty. If we can't define what we want, we become anxious. These are the negative emotions that we experience all the time. Now, what do we do with these emotions? How, how do we deal with them? And I suggest to you there are three possibilities, especially our negative emotions. We can suppress them, push them underground, or we can express them, let them out, or we can confess them. And I want to show you that Jonah did all three of those things through the story of this book. You see, first of all, we can suppress or repress our anger. That is, we can push it below the surface of our lives, usually in the hope it will go away. But it doesn't. It'll come out in our behavior without our realizing it. See, Jonah expressed his anger about Nineveh in chapter 1. He never says a word about Nineveh. He pushes it underground and he begins to run in the opposite direction. It begins to determine his behavior. He heads off for Tarshish. In chapter 2, when he's in the belly of the fish, he prays, and we looked at this prayer a couple of weeks ago, but to be absolutely honest, and I hesitate in saying this, but I'm going to say it, this prayer is actually fairly superficial. And I'll tell you why. He doesn't deal with the real issues. He only deals with the symptoms. I have disobeyed God. And I'm sorry I disobeyed God. And I confess I disobeyed God. But he does not begin to examine why did he disobey God. What was the undercurrent reason for that? There's nothing in his prayer about Nineveh and his attitude to the city of Nineveh. The reason why he confesses his condition in John in chapter 2, if I can be blunt, is because his bluff has been called. God has outwitted him, found him out. His disobedience has been exposed. And most of us are willing to say sorry once we've been found out. John has been found out. But there's no word of repentance of his attitude towards Nineveh. Why? Because he suppressed that. He probably hasn't acknowledged it even to himself. He has buried it thinking I've got rid of it, and he hasn't. It's driving him from underground, as our suppressed emotions do. And that makes him dangerous. Dangerous even to himself. He's not sure what he's going to do next. That's one thing we can do with our negative emotions. We can suppress them. The second thing we can do is we can express them. I mean, if somebody makes you anger, you can, angry, you can simply punch them on the nose. That'll, that's expressing your anger. It'll probably make you feel good. It probably won't solve very much. Now, when Jonah goes to Nineveh in chapter 3, he has a message which he can express with absolute conviction and passion. His message is, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. Now, he can preach that with passion, with energy, with conviction with emotion. In fact, such was the conviction with which he preached that message that the city believed and repented. His attitude towards Nineveh is coming out in his confessing his anger at this nation in his preaching. And by the way, if I can just say as an aside, it's really not the content of a preacher's message that makes it effective, but it's the emotions behind it that give it its energy and its penetration. You see, behind our words always is a backing track of our emotions, and those who have ears to hear will hear it. You can hear behind what somebody says that they're either genuine or they're phony. You can listen to two people say the same thing, but you know one is not real. You pick it up. You pick up the vines. You know when somebody is kind, when somebody is loving. You know when they're giving respect to those to whom they're speaking. And you know when they're angry and you know when they're phony. 
The only ones of these that we can deliberately manufacture, by the way, are the phony ones. You can't, you, you can't produce sincerity that's unreal by definition. And you know, underneath the surface of what comes out externally is, is what's going on internally in a heart, and, and, and it's difficult to hide it. I remember once, some years ago, staying at the home of a couple in the United States. I was there to preach at a church, and they, that they accommodated me for those few days with a couple, and the man used to operate a lie detector, and he had one at home. So I said, does it really work? He said, yes. So I said, okay, ask me some questions. We got out this lie detector. Ask me some questions, things you know nothing about. He didn't know me then. He said, how many children do you have? I said, four. The machine said, lie. <laughs> I said, how does it know? He said, it picks it up in your voice. She said, how many children have you got? I said, two. Lie. How many children have you got? Three. True. What's your wife's name? Marjorie. Lie. What's your wife's name? Ethel. Lie. Doris. Lie. Hillary. True. How do you know? How does that machine know? I mean, it works, apparently. Now, my wife says I would never get away with lying. Not, not that I do, but what she means is that uh, she said she can read on your face everything that's going on. I know exactly what, you know, what's going on. So she tells me. <laughs> but it's true. It's true, actually. I read a book recently called Blink. Some of you read it. It's a, it's a good selling book. And uh, it sort of talks about the impressions that you pick up, not with your ears, not the facts that you are informed, but there's a gut sense within us that picks out something. Blink, meaning in the first blink, you get the idea of something and first impression is often a true one. That, my daughter read that book. It has a test. You can go online and do a test with that, from that book uh, as, to, uh, as to what you really think about certain things. And uh, she did and came back and said, no, I didn't know. This, this, tells, this test tells me that I'm a racist. It tells me I'm this. And tells me. She told me this. I said, really? She said, yeah, you try it. So I tried it. And I was all these same things as well. I said, it must be biased. She said, no. You, and going back to the book, and it said, you know, how the guy who wrote the book had done the same test, and it's to do on your instantaneous response to pictures and images and things and words. And Jonah, under the surface, you see, ha has an emotion towards Nineveh that comes out when he expresses it, when he preaches in such a way that people say, this guy is for real. And he was. Forty more days, you'll be destroyed. I'm so glad about that, is Jonah's response under the surface. You can suppress your negative emotions, you can express your negative emotions, or you can confess your negative emotions. Now, this is what Jonah begins to do in chapter 4. And at last we come to the real Jonah. And effectively, what he says to God is this, God, I'm angry with the Ninevites because I know what kind of people they are. They deserve your judgment. And a couple of weeks ago, I told you some of the things we know about the Ninevites and their evil, wicked ways, their destructive ways. Jonah knew all of that. And he said, I'm angry with the Ninevites. They don't deserve your favor. Secondly, God, I'm angry with you. Because in my view, God, although... Being gracious sounds nice. Being compassionate sounds good. Slow to anger sounds good. Abandoning in love sounds good. All these things about you, God, sound good. But actually, in my view, you are far too soft. Now we're getting somewhere. Jonah's being honest here. God, I actually don't like the fact that you're this nice and kind. He doesn't apologize for this. He's just brutally honest. And by the way, never apologize to God when you feel angry towards him. Tell him. Tell him why you feel that way. Tell him why you feel such and such is unjust. Tell him why you're unhappy with the way things have seemed to have gone on. 
You can f- confess this. And God doesn't say, Oh, Jonah, 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 you don't understand me. Jonah, Jonah, calm down, man. Let, let me just... No, he says, fine, Jonah, I can take that. I can take that. God answers by asking questions, by the way. He doesn't give explanations. He asks questions that back Jonah into corners where he has to think a little bit harder, a little more deeply. And sometimes our response is superficial. You know what Jonah is doing with his anger, by the way, by, by seeing where it is directed. When he suppressed his anger, it was directed towards himself. That is, he in- internalized it. It simply governed what he did and how he behaved. That's what happens when you suppress your anger. When he expressed it, it was directed towards others. He went into Nineveh and said, 40 days and you are history. And he preached it with vigor and enthusiasm and genuineness. He directed it to others. But in chapter 4, when he confessed his anger, and I don't mean by confessing he was apologizing for it. He never apologizes for it by the end of this chapter, but he confessed by saying, this is the way it is, it's addressed to God. When he addresses it to God, when he confesses to God, now we can begin to do something about it. You see, God loves genuineness in us. It's better to be honest with wrong understanding and even with wrong motives than to, be, than to pretend to have the right motives Better to be honest with wrong motives with God than to pretend to have the right ones. And now this presents a teachable moment in Jonah's life because the moment we become honest, even though in our honesty we've got things wrong, that is a marvelous moment in our lives because that's when we become teachable. And God uses three visual aids to teach Jonah three important things. He uses a weed, he uses a worm, He uses a wind. Three things. In verse 6, a weed. In verse 7, a worm. In verse 8, a wind. Let me just remind you that the setting after God has said that he will not destroy the city is that Jonah goes up onto the hillside, presumably when it came to the 40th day, to look down over the city to see what would happen to it. Why? Why? Well, I suspect that Jonah believes that God is still going to do something. Maybe he believed that God's judgment was going to be only postponed, given a little bit longer. Maybe he thought, well, you know, everybody repents when they're cornered and told that they're wrong. Maybe their repentance isn't genuine and God sees that. I don't know. We can only speculate about the reason why Jonah went up to sit and watch. And he sat up there in the blazing sun to see what would happen. And the first thing God does as Jonah sits there is in verse 6, the Lord God provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his comfort. The first thing God did was make this vine. I've called it a weed. We're not sure what it was exactly, but it was enough to provide shade and shadow for Jonah, to give him the experience of relief and comfort from the hot desert sun above. And it says in verse 6, Jonah was very happy about the vine. No doubt he saw it as a sign of God's goodness, God's kindness, God's love towards him, God's protection, all of which it was. God cared about Jonah's comfort. That's the first thing God does, and Jonah is sitting very happy about the vine. The second thing God does is in verse 7. At dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the vine so that it withered. Next day, he provided a worm which ate its way into the root of the weed, somewhat so that it withered, and Jonah now is exposed again to the hot Arabian sun. But God hasn't finished with him yet. Third thing God does is in verse 8. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Not only is he back to being exposed to the hot sun, but now a scorching wind blows off the east. That is off the 
desert of the east of Nineveh there, which was hot and scorching, so much so that Jonah becomes faint, it says. And at the end of verse 8, it says that he wanted to die. It's better for me to die than to live. I mean, this is, guy's pathetic, actually, isn't he? This is the second time now. In six verses, he wanted to die. God has sent him a weed to shelter and protect him. The weed made him glad. God sent a worm. It says that God sent these things. A worm to eat into the root and destroy the shelter. And the worm has made him mad. And then God sent a wind to scorch him. And that made him sad. So much he wished that he was dead. He went from being glad to being mad to being sad and suicidal. What a whiner this guy is. And then God comes in with the final statement of the book in verse 9. He says to Jonah, Do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, said Jonah. I'm angry enough to die. That's the third time, by the way, he wants to die. And then God says to him, verse 10 and 11, this is the punchline of the book. The Lord said, You've been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left. That probably means 120,000 children. They don't know their right from their left. Vulnerable. Young. The estimation is about 600,000 population of Nineveh at the time. So these 120 on the right and the left are probably children. And many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? It says, and you turn over your page to read Jonah chapter 5 and you say, there isn't one. Why isn't the question ever answered? It kind of finishes in midair. We're left in limbo. We're left with a question, an unanswered question. Should I not be concerned about that great city? You see, here's the message. What the shade of the vine was to Jonah, the salvation of God was to Nineveh. God draws a parallel between the vine in Jonah's experience And Nineveh, you have been concerned about this vine, though you didn't tend it or make it grow. It sprang it overnight and it died overnight. Yet, you could not care less about Nineveh, Jonah. You are hurt and angry by the removal of the vine and its shade to you personally. Don't you understand? I am hurt and angry by the removal of protection from Nineveh. When I was preparing this, my mind went to a hymn that I haven't sung for a long time, but the words came back to me that speaks of the cross as being a shade, very much as the vine was a shade to Jonah. The words of the hymn, many of you will know it, Beneath the cross of Jesus I fain would take my stand, the shadow of a mighty rock within a weary land, a home within the wilderness and rest upon the way from the burning of the noontide heat and the burden of the day. And the hymn writer, whether they had in mind Jonah's experience in Jonah 4, I don't know, but speaks of the cross as being a shadow that protects us from the burning of the noontide heat and the burden of the day. Jonah, you experienced the protection of the vine over you And you were grateful for that, but you have no concern about the protection of my love and compassion and mercy for the people of Nineveh. You see, Jonah has never emotionally connected with the plight of Nineveh or with the heart of God. And I don't think we'll learn the lesson of Jonah unless we realize that this is about being emotionally connected with our world and its needs and with God and his heart towards the world. Jonah was certainly an emotional person just in chapter 4 alone. 
you see him on a roller coaster of emotions. He's angry four times. He's pleased once, and then he's displeased. He's very happy about the vine, and then he's depressed and suicidal when it disappears from him. He's certainly an emotional man. They, they ebb and flow, but his emotions are never aligned with the emotions of God. And I suspect that Jonah probably thought God was too big to have emotions. God's been here, done that too many times to experience emotion. But that is not true. God's emotions, Scripture tells us, are very tender and very real. Right back in the early part of the book uh, of Genesis, I, I think one of the most penetrating verses that expose to us God's heart is in Genesis 6, verse 6, where it says, The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. That's before he sent the flood in the days of Noah. He was grieved. His heart was filled with pain. God knows what pain is in his heart. Jonah had no pain at all for Nineveh. The only pain Jonah experiences in these four chapters is the pain of his own inconvenience and his own suffering and his own needs. And they were not being met. And you know it's possible to be clinically correct about God but cold about Him? Clinically correct about the gospel, but cold about it. We know and we're clinically correct about the needs of our world, but we're cold when it comes to involvement in meeting those needs. We can be correct about world mission, but couldn't care less about the people in the office where we work and the place where we live. We're cold towards them. Though we'd meet together in a group like this and we would affirm the need to take the gospel into all the world. I've called this message grumbling about grace. The reason being that the end Jonah has conformed his mind to the mind of God and his will to the will of God. He has gone to the right place eventually but he has never captured the heart of God. Never experienced the emotions of God towards Nineveh. The feelings of God towards Nineveh. And I believe that probably the greatest need of the Christian church and the greatest need of Christian people is to become aligned to his heart. We can be good at aligning our thinking with his mind. We, we can know this book. And we need to know this book. We need to know the mind of God because it's through the mind of God that we find the heart of God. But look beyond the statements about his will and his mind to understand what is the undergirding emotion in the heart of God. I can't tell you there's a switch to flick to connect with the heart of God. It's something you and I individually and personally in our walk in life, in our experience of life, many of the experiences of life teach us the heart of God. You see, the idea of the weed and then the worm and then the wind was not just to make life unpleasant for Jonah. It was to reveal God's heart. Now, you don't know when God's going to send the, the weed and then the worm and then the wind or its equivalent in your life. But in the experiences of life, the good and the bad, the tough and the difficult, the ones that make you rejoice and the ones that make you weep in those experiences of life, look beyond them to its revelation of God's heart. And Jonah finishes with an unanswered question. We don't know what happened to Jonah. When I get to heaven, I've got a list of people I want to visit and meet. And Jonah wasn't on that list until this week. And I thought, you know, this is unfinished business here. I want to go knock on his door and he'll say, listen, I'm fed up with this question. 
Everybody's asking me the question, did I get the message? And if he talks to me, I got, I'll say, I, I, I gather you didn't, Jonah. <laughs> You're still angry. Look at that. I don't know. God is kind enough to not tell us because really the message is not about Jonah, it's about you and it's about me. And that's what's given to us in Holy Scripture. That we look into this story and look, as we so often do, into a mirror that throws back man. I'm as superficial as Jonah is. I'm as surface-oriented as Jonah is. I'm not penetrating into the heart of God and my own heart even, and understanding my own heart, understanding how my heart becomes aligned with His. So here's the question. Should I not be concerned with that great city? Jonah, should you not be? Should you not have this heart? I want to ask you this question. Should you not have this heart? Should I not have this heart? Is aligned with God. We don't just do the right things, though we do, and obey his instructions. We do so with that passion and compassion and urgency and genuineness that comes from him.